Okay guys, so the poem we're going to be looking at today is The McBride Dynasty by Paul Durkin. This is one of Durkin's kind of more complicated poems. There's a lot of uh, context to understand to this poem. So this could be kind of a, quite a long video just going through, trying to make sure you understand the background to Durkin, to his family, and you know some of the issues that are coming up in this poem as a result of that. So, as you see on the board, on the uh, display at the moment, we'll look at uh, Durkin's family. So, Durkin was related to a very famous couple from Irish history. Uh, some of you will have heard of these people. They are Major John McBride and Maud Gon. Maud Gon is an incredibly famous Irish woman. She uh, is very, very influential in Irish history. So, we need to understand her in this poem. The poem is based around her. Um, so. Major John McBride, this was um, the uncle of Durkin's mother. Okay. So Durkin's uncle, Durkin's grand uncle, the uncle of his mother, was Major John McBride. Uh, John McBride was very important um, in uh, military history of Ireland. Um, the thing he's most remembered for at the moment is that he was second in command of the troops at the Jacob's Biscuit Factory during the 1916 Rising. So the Rising of 1916, he was very, very involved in the, day of, in the days of the Rising, um, and he was executed in Kilmainham Jail, one of the 16 men executed after the Rising uh, because of his involvement. So he's gone down as quite an important Irish hit hero because of his involvement in that. Now, he was married at a younger, before the Rising, he married a woman called Maud Gaughan. Now, Argon is probably one of the most famous women in Irish history. So she married McBride as a young woman, uh, but they did divorce soon afterwards. Now, they had a son called Sean McBride while they were married. Sean McBride went on to become incredibly important. He was a very, very important uh, politician uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. He was involved in the IRA in the 1930s, 1936-39, I believe. He was uh, one of the leaders of the IRA, uh, but he also won the Nobel Peace Prize in later years and was involved in setting up Amnesty International. So all three members of that family, incredibly, incredibly important uh, figures in Irish history. Maud herself, though, was very important. She was a revolutionary. She was a member of Coming Amon. She founded the Daughters of Ireland. She was a suffragette, promoted women's rights. She was one of the great, um, you know, hugely influential in women's rights and the Republican movement in Irish history. She was also very, she's also very famous for having been the inspiration and the, what's called the muse, was a beautiful person who inspires a poet, uh, for W.B. Yeats. So we've all heard of W.B. Yeats, um, you know, one of the greatest Irish poets. She, well, he was basically in love with Maud Gaughan. He proposed to her a number of times she never accepted. But she inspired a huge amount of his poetry. Uh, she also was an actress and played uh, a very important role, Kathleen Houlihan, in a play written by Yeats. Uh, so Yeats and a lady, a woman named Lady Gregory, wrote together, and she played the role of Kathleen Houlihan, who was an important mythical kind of uh, Irish woman. Um, that goes through Irish tradition, but we'll talk about that in a little bit more in a few minutes. So. All three of these people, especially Morgan, we need to be uh, very aware of who she is and her importance in Irish history in this poem. Alright, so let's get started and look at the poem itself. Alright, so the poem is called the McBride Dynasty. What young mother is not a vengeful goddess, spitting dynastic as well as motherly pride? In 1949, Black Ford, Anglia. Now that I have become a walking, talking little boy, Mummy drove me out to visit my great aunt Maud Gaughan in Roebuck House in the countryside near Dublin to show off to the servants of the Queen the latest addition to the extended family. Although the 80 year old Kathleen Houlihan had taken to her bed, she was keen as ever to receive admirers, especially the children of the family. Only the previous week, the actor McLean Moore had been kneeling at her bedside, reciting Yeats to her his hand on his heart, clutching a red rose. Cousin Sean and his wife, Kid, led the way up the stairs, Sean opening the door and announcing my mother. Mummy lifted me up in her arms as she approached the bed, and Maud leaned forward, sticking out her claws to embrace me 
her lizards of eyes darting about in the rubble of the ruins of her beautiful face. Terrified, I recoiled from her embrace and, fleeing her bedroom, ran down the stairs out onto the wrought iron balcony until Sean caught up with me and quieted me and took me for a walk in the walled orchard. Mummy was a little but not totally mortified. She had never liked Maud gone because of Maud's betrayal of her husband, Mummy's Uncle John, Major John, most ordinary of men, most humorous, courageous of soldiers, the pride of the family, whose memory always brought laughter to my grandmother Eileen's lips. John, she used to cry, John was such a gay man. Mummy set great store by loyalty. Loyalty, in Mummy's eyes, was the cardinal virtue. Maud Gone was a disloyal wife, and therefore not worthy of Mummy's love. But for dynastic reasons, we would tolerate Maud, but we would always see through her. Okay, so I want to ask you, I suggest I like, just take a pause here, read through the poem one or two more times. It's probably going to take a few readings to really get what's going on in the poem. Okay, so do pause here and read through it yourself and just make sure you're keeping up with the basic story of what's going on. So, initial impressions. We should be looking at, just to kind of get our grounding with the poem is, based on your first reading, what does Durkin's mother think of Maud Gone? And what attributes does Durkin's mother seem to hold quite highly? Why might this be important? And why does Durkin, as a child, run away from Maud Gone? So again, just have a moment to think about those questions, okay? You should be able to get those questions. If you haven't gotten those, the answers to those questions, I'd suggest pausing again, going back, reading through the poem again, because really you should be able to get that kind of level of impression from this. So uh, we should know that uh, Durkin's mother doesn't like Margon. Okay, so we see down towards the end of the poem, uh, in line 27, she had never liked Margon because of Maud's betrayal of her husband, Mummy's Uncle John. So Maud, uh, Durkin's mother doesn't like Maud Gon, despite her historical importance. Anyway, uh, what attributes does mother, Durkin's mother seem to hold, hold quite highly, and that is loyalty. Okay, so loyalty is a very, very prevalent theme throughout this poem. Do you need to be aware of it? And why does Durkin as a child run away from Maud Gon? And really it just seems to be that she is an elderly lady and he's frightened by her appearance. Okay, but there is some symbolism to that that we'll go into later. Uh, but as a child in the anecdote, it's just that he is frightened by the appearance of Maud Gone. Alright, so going into it line by line, okay, or breaking it down. We look at the first eight lines. Now maybe it's more this is not broken into stanzas. The whole poem is written as a single stanza, which is breaking it up here help to uh, you know be able to approach it more easily. So lines one to eight. What young mother is not a vengeful goddess, spitting dynastic as well as motherly pride. In nineteen forty nine in the black Ford Anglia, now did I have become a walking talking little boy. Mummy drove me out to visit my grand aunt Maud gone in Roebuck House in the countryside near Dublin to show off to the servant of the Queen the latest addition to the extended family. So just a few things to think about. So what question does Durkin open the poem with? Right? What type of question is that? What is he asking? What do you think the bride, yeah, sorry, the McBride dynasty refers to? Where is Durkin bringing him and why? Sorry, where, I should say, where is Durkin's mother bringing him and why? Who else do we know wrote poems about Maud Gone? And who is the servant of the Queen mentioned in line 7? Sorry, I just have to notice if I can spell the name there. Alright, so have a quick think about those questions okay, before we move on. If you want to make another more point to be able to figure out some of this information out yourself. I'm probably just waiting for the answers. So maybe pause again and we'll think about those questions. Alright, so first question we looked at, what question does Durkin open the poem with? And he asks, so he opens asking a rhetorical question, if all mothers are vengeful goddesses, or vengeful goddesses, who are full of pride and family uh, dynastic and, and their children. So obviously the answer is, yes, most mothers or young mothers are full of pride for their family and for their children. Okay? It's an obvious answer, yes. But there's something 
deeper to that. Why is he asking a question? Who maybe is that question actually referring to? Who is the vengeful goddess? Who is the, the mother? Is it definitely his own mother? Could it be someone else? Uh, like Bride Dynasty, that's just referring to Durkin's family. So it's the mother, his mother's side of the family. His mother was a McBride. This is her side of his family. Um, where is Durkin's mother bringing him to him? Why? She's bringing him to meet Malkon. So, though we like that, though we do know that she never liked Malkon, we learn that later in the poem. Maud is a very important older woman in the family. And they have to keep up the facade of loyalty within the family. She has to bring her child to, come to meet this important member of the family. Uh, we know also that W.B. Yeats wrote uh, poems for Maud Gone, and in the opening lines here, so what young mother in, is not a vengeful goddess, spitting dynastic as well as motherly pride. The language here isn't really what we expect of Durkin. It's more similar to what we would expect of Yeats, and Durkin is intentionally mimicking Yeats in those lines. He's mimicking that style, showing that you know, Maud Gone is getting yet another poem dedicated to her. She had a number of poems dedicated by Yeats. Yeah. And the servant of the Queen. So this is a strange one. Now we know, I've told you already that Maud Gon was an Irish Republican. She fought for the Irish Republic, very much fought against the British. So why is he referring her to her as the servant of the Queen? Uh, now this is because so Maud Gon was born in England and in her own autobiography she referred to was called a servant of the Queen. So it's quite a sarcastic title she came up with for her own autobiography for her own book about herself for autobiography so it's crap and he's using that as a you know he's, po he's pointing out to you he's pointing to her autobiography kind of giving a claim to it giving a reference to her autobiography uh, there's also a sarcasm within the title there okay and just down the picture there just the imagery that is a 1949 black four time I guess that's the character but a nice car, you know, wouldn't have been common at the time in 1949 for everyone to have a car. So just adding into a kind of prestige around this family that, you know, they're going to Roebuck House sounds quite uh, prestigious. They have this they have this very nice car. Uh, it's definitely a privileged background for Durkin here. So as I keep going, just a few more notes. So we talked about the rhetorical question to start with what he mentioned. The answer is of course yes, you know, there is young mothers are very much proud of their children of course why wouldn't they be right so he's talking about his mother being proud of her young child and bringing her off but there's also a sense of Maud Gon being this vengeful goddess comes up later on uh, the unusually formal language as i said is uh, many critics see this as Durkin tipping his hat to Yeats he's using the Yeatsian style very different to his own personal style in that in its reference to the fact that he's writing a poem about Sorry about Mark on. Uh, Durkin is emphasizing a number of times throughout his poem how young he is. This is the view and the narrative of a young boy. Uh, he keeps using, so he talks about like, he says, I'm a walking, talking little boy. Uh, and he keeps using the term mummy. Uh, it's a very childish term. We want to do this important. We have to keep this in mind. This is coming through the eyes of a child. The, uh, so the dotted line, the servant queen, we said, is reference to the god's title for her autobiography. The tone around it may suggest a dislike. Uh, we know his mother disliked Gon. Maybe that uh, dislike has rubbed off on Durkin as well. And as I've already mentioned, we've, there's definitely a sense of grandeur and prestige around this family. So there, there's the Roebuck House, the name of the house, gives it very much a sense of uh, wealth. They're referred to as the first the dynasty rather than the family sense of importance and fame there, right? and this is uh, almost an element of nobility and hierarchy within this family, and maybe Durkin is critiquing this, maybe there's something going on there, he's trying to find out to this. Okay, I'm going to keep going then, so lines 9 to 25. Although the 80 year old Kathleen Houlihan had taken to her bed, she was keen as ever to receive admirers, especially the children of the family. Only the previous week, the actor McLeamore had been kneeling at her bedside reciting Yeats to her, his hand on her heart clutching a red rose. Cousin Sean and his wife Kid led the way up the stairs, Sean opening the door and announcing my mother. Mummy lifted me up in her arms as she approached the bed, and Maud leaned forward, sticking out her claws to embrace me, her lizards of eyes darting about in the rubble of the ruins of her beautiful, of her beautiful place. 
Sorry, that should say beautiful face. Sorry, I don't know why it was a typo there. I was just tired of checking the book. That should say beautiful place. Terrified, I recoiled from her embrace and fleeing her bedroom ran down the stairs out onto the wrought iron balcony till Sean caught up with me and quieted me and took me for a walk in the walled orchard. Okay, so a few questions just to think about here. What does Dirk and Call Morgan in line 9? This is the first line of the stanza. What impression of Morgan does Durkin want to establish in line 12, 10 to 13? What might we notice about the names used in line 15? And how does Durkin react to meeting Maud Gon? How is she described? What themes might this evoke? So again, I'm going to suggest just pausing here, thinking about the poem, and thinking about those questions, kind of finding answers to those questions before you move on through the video. Okay, so in line 9, he calls, he refers to uh, Maud Gon as Kathleen Hulahan. So, Kathleen Hulahan is a famous Irish mit uh, figure of Irish mythology. She's depicted as an old lady and she's very much a symbol of Irish culture. Morgan actually played Kathleen Hulahan in a play by the name Kathleen Hulahan, which was written by Yeats. So, there's a number of elements, a number of levels to that reference here. Uh, what impression of Morgan does Dirk want to establish in line to lines 10 to 13? Uh, so, Durkin seems to suggest that Gon is used to and enjoys being admired. She appears to be uh, to keep famous and important people company, so a very famous actor coming to her. She, you know, there's this sense of her liking or wanting admiration. Uh, what do we notice about the names used in line 15? So, he's using nicknames Cousin Sean and, wife, and his wife Kid. You know, this suggests familiarity with uh, a very famous family. You know, he's part of this family, even though Mod Gon. He's not, he doesn't know her yet, he knows these other people, he knows Cousin Sean and White Kid, and that, you know, Cousin Sean is, of course, Sean McBride, who is an incredibly famous, politi very important politician, who was very important in the Irish public movement in the 30s, later went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize, very, very prestigious man in his own right, okay, apart from the fact that he had an uh, important parentage, he was very much an uh, important individual himself, so by referring to him as Cousin Sean, that is just showing how much Durkin has been brought up in this privileged family. Uh, how does Durkin react to Morgan? How is she described? What themes might have disavoked? Might disavoke? So the description of Morgan makes uh, makes her seem like a monster. Okay, you know the lizard eyes uh, and the claws for hands. Uh, it's, this is Durkin as a child again. Just going back to this childish image that keeps coming, this childish persona keeps coming across. Durkin's a child when he's describing all of this. And he's terrified of doing one. So her political and her cultural importance to Ireland are not relevant to the child. As a child, he's terrified of this old lady just because of her appearance. So it's not that and it's not um, But he also mentions she had been a beauty in her years. Remember, this is a woman who has inspired one of the greatest poets in history to have written a huge amount of poetry about her. He actually he, uh, compared her to, her to Helen of Troy, who, if you're familiar with uh, Greek mythology, was known as being one of the most beautiful women in history um, and that's what she's been compared to so he does not the fact that she was beautiful he doesn't want to be too overly insulting here as a mother uh, when he's writing his poet now but he's showing as a child the child was scared of the appearance of the older lady um so just a few notes along those this section of the poem he does pay homage to Maud Gon's cultural as well as political significance so we've seen earlier on he talked about her as servant of the queen that is paying he was paying tribute to her political life there here by referring to her as Kathleen Hulan he's paying uh, homage to her cultural significance however by listing these professional accomplishments you know she is a family member she's not personal she's professional so perhaps you know he's pointing out this lack of personal relationship or personal admiration for her it's very much a professional relationship that, that's where his admiration comes from is her professionally um, there's very much a suggestion that Maud enjoys being uh, fond of, enjoys being admired, and just makes her seem quite self-indulgent. Okay, it's, not, it's not a likeable quality to want people to be fawning over you all the time. Like I've already uh, explained, Cousin Sean here is Sean McBride, a significant Irish Republican leader from the 30s through to the 1960s. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and Durkin is very much part of this powerful and significant family. Uh, 
this can help us, you know, when we first view this poem, we'll know, we know we're talking about these very important people. And what's going to come up later is the divorce between uh, John McBride and Maud Gone, which comes up at the end of the poem. Durkin is trying to establish this as a familial relationship in the, in the first place. People are going to be aware of the story. He doesn't want to be political, he wants to bring it down to a human family level. Okay, so he's doing that by making these uh, references to cousin Sean, wife, kid, and, by, and this kind of humorous image of Morgan and the child running away. He's trying to make it more human. Um, the description of Morgan is through the eyes of an innocent child. She's an older lady. Um, she's no longer the beautiful, the beauty that the Yates would have seen in her younger years. And this kind of description allows us to make Morgan human. And this means that when Durkin's mother dislikes her, we can accept that because Morgan is a human. She, we are not viewing her as this historical giant and this cultural, the incredibly important person anymore. She's a human, she's an older lady in the family. And so the final lines, so lines 26 to 34. Mummy was a little but not totally mortified. She had never liked Maud Gone because of Maud's betrayal of her husband, Mummy's Uncle John, Major John most ordinary of men, most humorous, courageous soldiers, the pride of our family, whose memory always brought laughter to my grandmother Eileen's lips. John, she used to cry, John was such a gay man. Mummy set great store by loyalty. Loyalty, in Mummy's eyes, was the cardinal virtue. Maud Gone was a disloyal wife, and therefore was not worthy of Mummy's love. For dynastic reasons, we would tolerate Maud, but she would always see, we would always see through her. A few questions here. Why did Durkin's mother not like Morgan? She may have been quickly. Are there any hints that Durkin may agree with or have been influenced by his mother? What image are we given of Uncle John? And this is John Bride. What are we told about the relationship with Morgan in the final lines? Okay, so again, I'm going to suggest you pause here for two minutes, look through the poem, come up with answers to those questions before moving on. So why did Durkin's mother not like Morgan? So Morgan and John McBride's divorce in 1905 was quite messy. McBride was accused of some very terrible crimes. Uh, in the course of this divorce, his reputation never truly recovered. Uh, Morgan is blamed by the family to an extent for this. You know, McBride, John McBride is seen as a hero of the family, especially after his uh, martyrdom in after 1916. So for her to have caused uh, damage to his reputation or been anyway connected to damage to his reputation is going to have left long scars in the family, long lasting scars in the family. Uh, are there any hints that Durkin may agree with or have been influenced by his mother? So the use of childish mummy's uncle and the pronoun we in the final line suggests that Durkin has been influenced by his mother. Okay, again, he's given us this childish language, he's a child who's been influenced by his mother. Now, it's not necessarily that he still agrees with this, but in the anecdote, yes he does. Uh, what image are we given of Uncle John? We're given a personal image, okay, so we're not given a political hero, we're not given the, uh, you know, significant historical figure. We're given a personal image through the uh, eyes of the mother looking to her uncle, even though I'm not sure if she actually ever met the uncle, but it knows the stories, and the grandmother, Eileen, who would have been John's sister. So we're given a very personal image here. From a family perspective, of him as a normal, happy, funny man, we're not being given the scandal that went around with the divorce. Uh, what are we told about the relationship with Morgan in the final lines? So, the McBride family dealt with Morgan, she was part of the family. You know, they, had to, they kept up the facade of a loyal, proper family, as would have been expected at the time, but they haven't forgiven her about these issues due to the divorce, and they distrust her despite her fame, fame, despite who she is, despite her significance, they definitely distrust her. John McBride, he is the hero of this family, not her. So just to add a few things onto that, so the poet suggests that his mother may have gotten some pleasure from the action to mock on, starts when he was a little ill, but not totally mortified. So his reaction to mock on, his running away, could have been insulting and definitely took away some of the aura of prestige around the woman, you know, she's no longer this uh, mythical, powerful, all-powerful woman in the room, you know, the child's reaction kind of undermines that. There's definitely a sense of underlying tension in the family here. You know that the mother that Durkin's mother is getting pleasure or is not totally mortified by this turn of events. Uh, Durkin brings a public scandal back to the personal familial sphere. So a lot of people knowing the poem, who are reading the poem, will have known the story of John McBride and Morgan beforehand. 
uh, and they will know what uh, John Cry would have been accused of, and they will be very much, you know, uh, they would already have made decisions about the relationship. He's trying to make it familial, bring it back to personal level, and it gives us a new kind of fresh insight, fresh look at it. Uncle John, though he died here, was it was very maligned during his life. Uh, he's presented here as innocent and jovial. He's the pride of the family. Uh, now, we'll come back to that yellow box in a second. We'll just down to the red one. Uh, just because the yellow one has quite a few important things to go through. Uh, Durkin may be making fun of himself in the poem for his childish views. You know, his views, this poem was published in 2007, a long time after the event, after the anecdote. Uh, 56 years, or 58 years, if my maths correct. Uh, so he may be poking fun on the use of the term mummy, which is not usually a term used in the Irish context. In Irish people use the mummy rather than mummy. So mummy could be making fun of the prestige and the privilege of the background he was brought up in, you know, and the fact that he believed his mother, and he could be making fun of himself there. So just keep that in mind. And so back to this yellow box, there's a few important points here. And this goes back to the main theme we would look at in this poem, and that is family loyalty. And it's very prominent at the end of this poem. So we see that Maud Gon is conceived as being a disloyal wife and is never forgiven by her in-laws. So she's never forgiven by the McBride family for this. John McBride seems the hero of the private family, yet her own, much of Maud Gon's own incredible achievements, which are huge, you know, we can't underestimate the significance of Maud Gon in Irish history, these go unmentioned. And she is seen as being vain and self-indulgent for listening to poems that were written about her. You know, very much the, the family does seem to be quite critical of her, and Durkin is concedes that. You know, he's very open about that. Um, for Durkin's mother, loyalty is the highest virtue for a wife. This may be quite difficult for Durkin, as his mother remained loyal to his father, and we know through the poem sport, particularly, that Durkin's relationship with his father was very, very strained. Right. So it might be quite difficult for him to see his mother who remained loyal to his man, who was quite abusive and was very difficult to deal with and was quite difficult, not, you know, the most, not the greatest father to Durkin himself. Uh, Durkin himself is, through his poem, also putting the family dynamic on public display. You know, the family are doing all of everything in this poem to keep up a, a public facade, you know, to keep the face of the family looking good in the public eye, and he's just tearing it down in this poem. Right, so is he being disloyal to the dynastic pride mentioned in the opening lines? Is he being disloyal to his family in this poem? We can question. Alright, so just to wrap up the themes, the imagery, the form and the language. The themes are pretty straightforward, but, and that's mainly what we've been talking about for the last 28 minutes from on now. Uh, the themes are family, loyalty, tensions and the debunking of misconceptions. Okay, so it's misconceptions around John McBride about the divorce and uh, Durkin is trying to defend his answers, defend uh, John McBride and you know re-establish his honour and his you know a good image for the man. Right, so he's, all of those are important themes. The imagery, does the imagery of a falseness or the facade that the family are putting up? Uh, they are trying to present a perfect picture of family life, however we know that this covering up the dislike and the distruth. Uh, is the image of Morgana is humorous and this makes a powerful woman and the extended family more approachable and relatable. Uh, Durkin's running away, though it could be, you know, it, it could easily be, a, it probably is a true anecdote. It is also symbolic of his rejection of that facade. He rejects the family dynamic, and he does that in the poem, through the poem. So the poem is a grown up version of him running away in a sort. So it's in, when he was a child, he didn't accept the, what he was supposed to do, which was to, you know, sit and, you know, go, Except the embrace from this important woman. Likewise, he's not uh, allowing the facade to control him in adult life. He's rejecting it and he's putting the family dynamics on display. Uh, the form is just like most of Durkin's poems conversational and it's anecdotal. Um, there's no stanzas, there's no rhyme, there's no strict meter, and this all adds to that conversational tone. It makes it more approachable, it makes us feel like he's speaking to us as a friend. So, this is by design. He wants us to feel intimate, an intimate relationship with his family and with the moment. And that's what he's doing by writing in this kind of conversational way. Right? That is, of course, other than the opening lines, which we already said were a allusion to Yeatsian style of writing. 
Finally then, the language, so the world described here as one of privilege. Uh, the use of the word mummy could be making fun of that privilege and there is a huge amount of exaggeration and alliteration in the use and description of Maud, just add a few techniques in there, you know, there's plenty of other techniques going on throughout this, which you should be able to go and spot yourself, but two of the ones, if you're struggling, are exaggeration in his reaction to the old lady, and there's a few lines with alliteration in there as well, just to compound that image. Okay, so, now there's quite a lot going on in this poem, okay, so I'm not going to ask you to do too much going on here. What I'm going to ask you to do, the task is simply, I want you to write me a few paragraphs explaining this poem in your own words. Right, just a huge amount going on here, okay, you might need to look through the poem a few more times, maybe look through, re watch through this video again, I know I've spoken quite fast going through it, but try and write down an explanation in your own words of what is going on in this poem. Okay, thank you.